Okay, uh, so we can go ahead and get started. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Gorman, there seems to be a lot of uh, written questions about glutathione and cancer. It's a very hot topic. So what does the literature have to say about these relationships? Um, Dr. Rubin, I, I have to congratulate you for having the courage to bringing this topic up. Um, it's one of the most controversial areas about glutathione and taking care of our health. And, and you can see from the slide here that this is an area that's drawn an incredible amount of interest. Almost 30,000 articles on PubMed. Now, the, the reason I say that this is controversial is that there are very distinct and differing opinions on how to approach this. At the very least, let me say that the literature can be very confusing. So let me start off by saying this. It's quite clear and agreed upon that people with low glutathione levels are significantly higher risk for the development of cancer. This has been shown by several methods, not just measuring glutathione levels, but more recently, because of our ability to, to look at the human genome and determine DNA coding. Now, these studies, which look at the individuals who have abnormal glutathione genes, show them to be particularly susceptible to cancer. This is very revealing. Now, what makes this situation even worse? is that cancer itself will further lower glutathione levels throughout the body. So study after study shows that total body glutathione is lower in cancer patients than in a healthy population. And this makes the patient's defenses even weaker. Now, this is further demonstrated by the strong evidence that cancer patients with higher glutathione levels have far few negative side effects from their chemotherapy and radiotherapy. In other words, higher glutathione levels improves the tolerability of treatment, which you're all aware uh, this treatment can be often as unpleasant as the disease itself. So, uh, Dr. Gutman, I've seen a lot of studies uh, that have demonstrated that glutathione levels in cancer cells are actually higher than normal. And somehow that seems uh, uh, counterintuitive to what you what you just showed. So can you comment on this? Well, as we mentioned before, this is one of the most challenging areas that we need to talk about. This here's a major reason for the confusion in the literature. When you measure glutathione levels in most solid tumors, you find that these cancer cells are actually high in glutathione. Very interesting. But this can lead us to coming up with contradictory conclusions. Let me explain and, and, uh, and pay attention to the next few slides because uh, you'll need to wrap your head around this. Now, for example, because these cancer cells are high in glutathione, the cancer cells themselves use this extra glutathione to protect themselves from the chemo or radiotherapy. In fact, this has been used to explain the resistance of some cancers to treatment that certain cases have. This uh, has led to a lot of research where cancer cells are grown outside of the body, what we call a cell culture. And experiments are done on these cancer cells themselves. Now, what's raised a lot of attention is that when you grow these cancer cells outside the body and you deplete glutathione levels in the cancer cells, you can make them more susceptible to damage by chemotherapy. So again, uh, this seems to argue in favor of lowering uh, glutathione in patients, not raising glutathione. So why are we not just lowering glutathione levels in cancer patients? This, this is a, a, a critical question. This is the key question that's been addressed in many clinical trials. And this is why we must make any major decisions of treatment methods based on human trials. I say this again and again, laboratory studies and animal studies, they're so important to our understanding. But when you take these experiments into human studies, 
so often we're surprised by the outcome in the real world. Now, this is important. When you lower glutathione levels in human patients before chemotherapy or radiotherapy, you'll find that the side effects of the treatment are so severe that the approach becomes impractical and unfortunately even results in death of some of the patients. But scientists are still trying to find a way to do this, so far with very little success. So, Dr. Gottman, that begs the question. So raising glutathione levels in oncology, is this a good idea or is this a bad idea? Well, I have to think that most well-read people would not argue too much with raising glutathione in patients who are not undergoing chemotherapy or radiotherapy. Again, uh, please ask your own oncologist his or her opinion on this before you use any supplements. And always listen to your doctor before you listen to something you found out online. So, uh, Dr. Gottman, what about raising glutathione levels for patients who are receiving chemo or radiotherapy? Now, this is what I've been proposing to doctors and scientists for a long time now. I have to tell you, this has been a long and difficult argument. You need to start by looking at all of the available literature and trying not to cherry pick the articles that are only supporting your point of view. So I, I welcome you all to do this yourself, especially the doctors. Always do your home, own homework. You'll find that the vast, vast majority of the successful studies looking at lowering glutathione before chemotherapy have been in tissue cultures, the test tube studies, not in live humans. And I say vast, vast majority because I've actually not found any that have been useful enough to consider using as a clinical intervention. Please, if, if anybody finds one, send it to me. I need to know. And, and just as importantly, I have not found a single article where raising glutathione levels in human cancer patients has backfired. None. So again, if you come across an article like this, I need to know. So send it to me. And uh, to make my life easier, because um, I've been spending so much time answering this question throughout the years again and again and again, I, I wrote this article. It essentially summarizes what we just spoke about, but in much more detail and with dozens of references. So Peel, please feel free to, to read this if, if you want a deeper understanding. So, Dr. Gorman, you're suggesting that raising glutathione levels in humans can improve outcome of chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Why is that? Well, here's where it gets a little bit technical. Uh, we need to look at some of the biochemistry about how glutathione is manufactured in the cell. And I'm not going to go through this whole pathway, don't worry. But it's important to note that there are many, many steps for a cell to take to make its own glutathione. Okay. If we narrow down tightly to one spot on this diagram, we can see that the amount of glutathione that could be made by a cell has a certain limit. Because you see, when you reach a certain ceiling of glutathione concentration, it will act to downregulate production or to slow down further production. So in this matter, a cell will make a pre-programmed amount of glutathione and no more. Now, because cancer cells already have super high levels of glutathione, it only takes a little bit of precursors to shut down production through negative feedback inhibition. Now, the first step was to show this in cell cultures, which Immunitech scientists have, have done in much earlier studies. Again, I, I'm not going to bore you with the details. Um, there you see, you see some references there if you want to look up these references to get deeper into this. But essentially, you see where levels drop at the end of these curves when glutathione precursors get too high in the tumor cells. So there's a term, uh, Dr. Gottman, selective modulation. So it seems to many to be a very complicated term. So can you simplify this for us? 
Well, of course, I, I, I tend to be a visual person, so let's look at a visual model. So here we see uh, a bunch of glutathione precursors. Uh, note that I labeled some of them CY for cysteine, the limiting amino acid, more specifically bonded or bioavailable cysteine. Now, when these glutathione precursors are taken up by normal healthy cells, they're used effectively to raise glutathione levels. But when they get to the cancer cell, which already has super high levels of glutathione, they cause the negative feedback mechanism to kick in, as we saw in the other series of slides. In simpler terms, the healthy cells start to produce glutathione, but the cancer cell is induced to make less glutathione. So effectively what happens, as you see here, it is a selective modulation of glutathione levels so that the glutathione levels climb in healthy cells but drop in cancer cells. Ultimately, the result is that the healthy cells become more resistant to the damaging effects of the chemotherapy, but the cancer cells have less resistance and so they could be damaged or die off quicker. Selective modulation. I, I hope it's a little bit clearer now. So, Dr. Gunman, uh, you always tell people, I think it's a famous quote, to either show them the research, 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 to prove what they say. So clearly, I'm going to ask you to show us the research. Has this been, has this been done? Well, you're asking what most people want to know. Show me some proof. So take a look at this. Let's just read the title. Cysteine-rich protein, in this case we're talking about a munical, reverses, please take note of this word, reverses weight loss in patients receiving chemotherapy and radiotherapy. This was the first study that ever showed a nutritional intervention, I'm not talking about things like anabolic steroids, that actually reversed the muscle loss seen in end-stage cancer patients. This uh, clinical study meets all the criteria for what we call a gold standard study in randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled, and, and it took place in multiple excellent cancer stations all across Canada. Initially, uh, we wanted to look at both lung and colon cancer, uh, but we didn't recruit enough bowel cancer patients, so we focused just on lung cancer. Uh, it's important to note that in our inclusion criteria, these patients had to have already shown signs of muscle loss. In other words, they were in late stage cancer by definition. Um, when we look at the outcome parameters, uh, some of the easy, very objective measurements were things like body weight, uh, cell mass, uh, hand strength. Of course, we also wanted to look at quality of life measurements, which really counts more for the patient's perspective. Um, these are a little bit more subjective measurements, so we used a number of different measurement profiles. You, you see them here. So let's look at some results. Here you go. A clear and significant increase in body weight and muscle mass first time ever. And here you see that the patients themselves reported significant improvements in their quality of living. This alone is critical. Finally, the burning question. Did these people live longer? Let me just point out this group of numbers. A year after this study was completed, we went back to see who could report on their condition. Listen to this. About 80% of the patients treated with Immunical were alive. Less than 50% of the patients who did not receive Immunical had passed away. Uh, these are very encouraging numbers and I'm calling out for more studies to further validate this. So let's summarize. Yes, we know that cancer cells are often found to be high in glutathione. In fact, it's this high level in cancer cells that may cause them to be resistant to treatment. 
when you grow these cancer cells outside of the body, then you lower their glutathione levels. This makes them more susceptible to being damaged or killed by chemo and radiotherapy. However, when you do this in a living organism, like a human being, this may lead to extremely high levels of adverse effects and even death. So this, so far, has not turned out to be an effective strategy. And here's where our own scientists have added significantly to the research. Through the use of precursors, glutathione levels can be selectively modulated with really promising results. So uh, thank you, Ruben, and thank you, everybody, for all of your attention and inviting me onto the call, uh, not to mention all the difficult questions you ask. <laughs> So I just want to thank you, Jimmy, for uh, this uh, this presentation. This is amazing, as, as you always are. Uh, I really appreciate the time you're taking to uh, consider this topic that I think uh, from the beginning, uh, it just brings so much interest, particularly because of what you said initially, that the uh, the literature is so confusing. You start reading, and, I, and you're, then you ask yourself, what, how come I'm giving immunocal to patients when in reality, I'm feeding the cancer cells. Yeah, yeah. And I think everyone gets confused about this. Yeah. So yeah. we don't want people to get an impression, but I think the key, as I wanted to summarize, is the, the fact that giving those precursors will allow pretty much to create the ceiling effect to downregulate the glutathione in the cancer cells. Is, am I right? Yes, yes. But the, the normal cells who are already starving from glutathione <laughs> increase their amount and they get stronger. If somebody finds a paper that shows me a study where they can lower glutathione in human beings and get a good outcome, I, I need to know. I need that's to know. A, that's a, that's a really good that. challenge. That's yeah. a good challenge. Um, any last words, Jimmy, about uh, the program and just uh, future endeavors? I, I just uh, do want to take the opportunity to let um, people know that there's more information that they can, they can get. Um, I, I post new research on glutathione at least two or three times a week uh, on my Facebook page, uh, Dr. Jimmy Gutman, one word. And, and of course, if you really want to get into it and you want to have a handle on so many different processes, um, th there I, I have put out uh, my latest book in, in Spanish um, that you could find at uh, glutathione.org. So with that, Jamie, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. So thanks again, everyone. Until next time.